A few more measures I'm afraid, these little ones for example, that said you need to know by the way. So we have first of all design stage planning and this is all about during the planning stage of your network, of your web application, actually taking time out to look at the security uh, perspective. So threat modeling is something you could talk about. This is putting yourself in the eyes of a potential attacker. So if you were to attack the system when it actually becomes implemented, when you move out of design, how would you go about it? Is there any immediate vulnerabilities? How would you get the data? How would you do certain things? I mean, um, you would factor this into your design. So you'd then design specific features for security to ensure that there's protection in place so that an attacker can uh, destroy your system. Audit trails sound like the most boring thing ever and they are records, I'm not going to dispute that, they are records of system and user events that are kept to be able to trace security issues and any flaws that happen in the operation. So these are just like records kept of everything that happens in the system, everything a user does to interact with the system. Um, and then you can look back and trace any issues, you can see um, if there's um, if something goes wrong, if something's starting to become a, an issue, you can then uh, action that uh, to try and fix it. Securing operating systems is a very important measure actually because as we mentioned in that video if you saw it, uh, OS's sit in between the application and the hardware so any issues in the operating system will kind of directly affect the application and therefore the user. So there's a few steps you can take. You might want to limit how many user accounts you have on your system so you don't want if say an employee leaves or a student leaves, you don't want their account to still be active, you want to get rid of it, so that that's not another entry point into the system. And again, you want access control, you want only if people who need to have the highest permissions to have the highest permissions. And this will include having directory permissions, so an admin might be able to change program files, but everyone else can't because you don't want them to affect the whole system. Similarly, well, not, not similarly, but a very basic point is having strong hidden passwords, so passwords which have a capital letter and a, a certain length and so on, and not no default passwords, no password as a password. And I say hidden because some operating systems strangely will allow anyone to see the passwords, but it's kind of stored in effectively a text document. I don't know why this is done, but you can get rid of that, you can hide your passwords like most operating systems do. Also, you're going to want to limit any software that runs automatically when you start a computer up. You want to only have the programs running that are needed. And finally, possibly the most important one is to install patches if any security holes get fixed. You've got to make sure you actually install it so you're uh, protected and actually updating your OS when it's time, when a new one comes out, like going from Windows 7 to Windows 10. Yeah, a lot of security that's come from people having very old operating systems like Windows 98, uh, Windows XP, which are nowhere near as secure as the latest operating systems. A lot of vulnerabilities come from code, and let's mention some good primary practices that will reduce this. So firstly, having regular code reviews is very important if you're working in a team, if you're working for a big company. These are peer inspections of code, so people will share their code and get other people to look through it in order to find mistakes. Often you won't notice mistakes in your own code, especially if the code's working okay, you won't necessarily see these mistakes, but actually they might be a vulnerability in a certain case, for example, that someone else might spot. Next, modular testing is very useful. Modular testing is where you write tests for small parts or kind of like individual functions of a program. So your program will do lots of functions probably and you'll write tests for each one. If you kind of do a few tests that are kind of generic ones, you're likely to miss something. So this is a much more specific way of going about it. And this is similar to unit testing you may have done. Um, which is more actually to do with the development so you're kind of writing tests as you go along. Modular testing is usually done completely separately to development so in the actual designated testing phase of the development life cycle. The next point is to use established design patterns and models. When you actually, I mean these are all talking about kind of a uh, software engineering team not just you doing your coursework because we, these don't really apply as much. So design patterns are kind of established templates which programmers will use when they're designing solutions to problems. So they're very, um, they've been refined over the years, they're very accepted, lots of people use them and they kind of have designs which are very secure in a way, I mean it's difficult to go into it if you haven't done object oriented programming but it's all about information hiding to make sure that information doesn't get leaked out of your program but it gets passed uh, among functions, well and design patterns will help you do that and also data models. So um, 
in lots of cases you'll have a model where you have your data and then you have an interface to interact with the model and this separation between the data and your interface means that you can't access the data directly, you have to go through the interface, a bit like how you have to go through the OS to access the hardware. So using these established designs and models is a good way to make sure your code is secure. If you're trying to do everything from scratch you're more likely to make a mistake. Going back to validation, actually validating your parameters is important, making sure all the data passed around your program is valid and at the earliest stage. So the first method that gets called in object oriented programming is your constructor and so you want to validate in the constructor not in a future method and a better example if you don't know what that means is um, you all, when you have to sign up for something you have to enter certain details it won't let you not enter certain details say for example there wasn't validation in a form to sign up to a website and it let you not enter a username that's going to cause some errors in a future stage for the database because you haven't validated at the earliest possible opportunity. Finally, you need to make sure errors are handled in your code or exceptions are handled in your code if you know what they are. So the errors don't, so the basic errors or basic exceptions don't cause termination. You don't want your program to crash at the earliest opportunity. You want it to kind of keep going even if you have a minor error. If you do have fatal errors that cause the program to terminate, you're gonna make sure that you um, uh, you save the state, you log the error and make sure this is done securely so that someone can't then access those logs at a future time.